session of the International Congress Urban Health. The Deputy Head of the Government of the Russian Federation, Tatiana Golikova. Head of the Federal Service for Supervision of Consumer Rights, Protection and Human Welfare, Anna Popova. The president uh, of the main international society for urban health, um, International Society for Urban Health, Joe Ivy Bufford. Vice Mayor for Social Issues and Health uh, Healthcare of Helsinki, Sanna Visekansa. Head of Health uh, Division, OECD. Francesca Colombo. <laughs> Vice President of the pharmaceutical company Novo Nordisk, uh, head of the program uh, Cities Changing Diabetes, uh, Nils Lund. Uh, specialist for the public health and transport planner and other of the approach healthy streets which has become the foundation of the transport strategy for London Lucy Saunders and the moderator of the plenary session is the senior vice president for innovation Skolkovo foundation Kirill Kayem And the mayor of Moscow, Sergei Sabyanin. Good uh, morning, dear friends. I'm pleased to welcome you at the Moscow Urban Forum. Welcome. And I'm wishing you every success in your work and in your endeavors. We have been holding this forum uh, the ninth consecutive year, and it has become a good and solid tradition. And um, today it would be difficult uh, to imagine Moscow agenda without considering any issues related to urban planning activities and the dialogue with expert community. About a dozen countries of the world are involved in these activities, but several years ago, the situation was somewhat different. We began to ponder of what would be the key forum which could be uh, implemented in Moscow, and it's quite obvious that what it took is to create a Moscow Economic Forum. But any self-respecting city should have an economic forum. It uh, goes without saying. And all the way from the city of Kaliningrad to Vladivostok, we are uh, running economic forums on an annual basis. And generally speaking, we began to make some efforts uh, pursuing this endeavor and made several attempts. But urban agenda and uh, requests of the city residents have been sending a slightly different message. Of course, the business problems uh, are important, such as administrative barriers, taxes, uh, preferences, and uh, things along these lines. Uh, all of these are a very important part of uh, municipal authorities and uh, public community. But nevertheless, among the main issues of the city of Moscow, they had been um, different. It became obvious that with every new year, there were a bunch of different problems. There were snowballing, the problems related to uh, environmental issues, uh, public transportation with the uh, over density of population, certain discomfort, stress levels in the city. With every year, city was becoming less and less fitting and comfortable for life. And it has become obvious that the main issue which concerns both business community and the urban community, they are the issues of different nature. They are the issues of the urban planning and development, creating comfortable environment for living. And having began to 
um, doing this forum, we came to realize that we've made a right decision on, on placing priorities and uh, discussing these uh, topics with uh, global experts and with people living in Moscow. Having been working for many years in the Western Siberia, we had been attracting investors. We had been presenting them vast territories, which would be commensurate with uh, territories of uh, European countries. And we had been sharing how many oil and gas reserves we have. And those investors who would come from all over the world, and even from Moscow, they could not care less about what kind of cities we had been living in and the urban uh, economy, urban development and investments require um, different type of approaches. Moreover, our cities, having gone the way of industrial development, have transitioned into a different level of development. Uh, they engage different economy, economy of services. And the principal thing in this economy are investments related to human capital to human development and investments in building residential real estate, commercial facilities, investments in science, in, in new technologies, in new developments. And most importantly, in all these areas, the main capital would be uh, human capital. And uh, it's obvious for the city to be growing and expanding, attracting new investments. The most important endeavor is to take care of people living in the city. And it only makes sense that uh, the topic of our agenda today is a range of issues related to urban policies, how to make it the city um, growing, continuing to uh, build up and expand. But at the same time, any construction projects, any development would at the same time create very comfortable environment for people to live in. And this conflict between existing and new construction projects and attracting investments and at the same time attempting to preserve the environment is the main issue related to urban agenda, to urban policies and urban development. Of course, we are going to continue the issues related to transportation, which is one of the key issues for any big megapolis. And Moscow is not an exception. We have done a lot in this regard. The city is engaged in very big uh, construction, transportation construction project, but still uh, problems are quite acute and they require further considerations, discussions and um, attention. Of course, we will be discussing issues related to renovation of the housing stock which is quite uh, pressing and quite relevant uh, issue, not only for the city of Moscow, but also for a large number of global cities. Moscow is beginning the largest uh, renovation, housing stock renovation pro uh, program in the world, so-called the obsolete uh, stock from uh, 1950s and 60s, so, which are in very uh, bad conditions and which housing over one million residents. Of course, it is very important to us to consider the issues related to the city environment and ecology. We are going to discuss the range of issues related to um, improving the uh, landscape, improving the uh, the urban environment, um, the um, in, in building parks and um, expanding green territories. We will discuss the urban program My uh, Neighborhood, which is called to have a comprehensive look at the territories where the most Moscovites are living, most of the city dwellers. And uh, today, this is the key uh, program to improve uh, urban environment. We are going to talk about new technologies, about smart city, which are also driver of uh, modern cities development. One key uh, agenda topic what we're going to discuss today is uh, urban health, healthy city. And it's basically a new perspective on what we are doing, what we do and uh, why we do what we do in a city. We will look on how uh, certain te technologies and certain urban tendencies are impacting health status of the city and uh, of people living in the city. 
In the last decade, we've been witnessing the ever-extending life expectancy overall in the country and in the cities. Actually, in the cities, the dynamism of life expectancy is even more pronounced than in rural areas. At the same time, we can see the increase of the chronic diseases related to new lifestyles, stresses, nutrition status, and issues related not only to healthcare but also with urban environment, with lifestyle diseases and how they're impacting uh, status of the residents, they're very, very relevant. And I am hoping that the next urban forum will be dedicated not only to uh, attempting to ensure that the, the Muscovites would live longer, would be healthy, but also to make them happier. Thank you and wishing you every success. Dear colleagues, uh, good morning again. As uh, Sergei Sabianin has pointed out, it's a ninth time that we are gathering here to speak about urbanism, but probably previous urban forums uh, were uh, pointing our attention to the range of issues related to connection between urbanism, urban planning, construction, uh, city management, and healthcare. And this is why uh, this uh, coefficient or factor of health. Uh, which for homo sapiens, for our kind, is related to just feeling your own health and your own physical well-being. For the first time this year, we've decided to build a special section. It's like a forum within a forum. And within today's, in addition to discussing construction plans and city programs, you have a chance to attend uh, certain sessions related to health and connection between health and urbanism. And today, we in our distinguished speaking panel will discuss these issues as it is applied to the bird, bird's eye view, we will identify main problems. And within these two days, all the experts will be um, working here. And you um, may attend specialized session based on the topics of your interest. And tomorrow at 3.30, we are going to sum up the results of our work. We will have a special session dedicated to what kind of outcomes can be identified after two days of work and what kind of uh, tools and methodologies we can employ based on the outcomes of the urban forum to be used here in the capital of the country. But going back to the issue of urbanism, actually the global population is being urbanized with amazing and terrifying speed. According to WHO, 68% uh, of the population in 30 years will be living in big cities, in mega cities. Of course, it uh, will provide a lot of benefits to these people, a lot of uh, good factors for the population, but nevertheless, very high concentration of population also entails uh, certain problems. Uh, you may divide them notionally in two parts. Number one would be the issues of health care or issues related to epidemiology or, or range of questions related to accessibility and affordability of healthcare and some diseases related to environment and the um, inactive lifestyle. And the second cluster of problems would be the long-term programs enabling to maintain health status of population on a higher level, what Sergei Sabianin has already mentioned. And I would like to um, ask uh, Tatiana Golikova. In fact, we know some examples of some countries, for example, that of China, where there are issues related to national wide nationwide programs which enable the nation to overcome persistent trends so that from the standpoint of uh, life plan to include for example, the China has uh, urbanization program and a special uh, section related to the healthcare in within the context of urbanization in terms of the federation and the federal programs what kind of approaches are deemed the most important the most valuable when we speak about urbanism and healthcare tatiana the floor is yours on behalf of the government of the russian federation i would like to welcome you and uh, to share what is going on in the Russian Federation when it comes to the uh, issue uh, identified by our moderator. As it has been mentioned, urbanization is one global tendency of the 21st century, and it uh, has a huge impact on the, on the human health. Russia is not an exception. 75% 
of the total population lives in cities in our country. One third of them is lives in the cities with a million plus population. On one hand, uh, when you live in the city, you have more accessibility to your social medical uh, services. A very well developed infrastructure enables one to have a very healthy lifestyle. But uh, by providing these kind of opportunities, cities, among other things, create some health issues. It has been already noted, and I would like to reiterate that uh, there are four items. I believe these items are important. Number one is unfavorable um, environmental impact, ecological problems um, related to quality of air and water, increase of the waste, uh, the noise uh, contamination. They are all prerequisite to development of the uh, bronchial asthma, allergic reactions, uh, uh, cancer diseases, nervous system diseases, and many others. Secondly, low physical activity of the urban residents uh, due to high accessibility of transportation sometimes entails the cardiovascular diseases, diseases of the uh, locomotive system. Number three, high density of population. Is, um, is a breeding ground for uh, infectious diseases and high mobility of population and, uh, and the transportation links increase all these risks. And number four, very high concentration of uh, machinery and vehicles sometimes results uh, of the um, trauma levels and uh, the widespread of these diseases in the city is 1.5 times higher than in rural communities. And of course, we have to address these issues by a whole conception, which has been developed related to big cities and big uh, uh, metropolitan areas and quite a high level of uh, health care development, as it has already been uh, noted by Sergei uh, Sobyanin in his introductory speech, sometimes um, results that um, life expectancy in cities is higher than in rural communities. Russia is not an exception after 2018. In the city, life expectancy were two years higher than in non-urban areas. Therefore, the processes of aging of population and the challenges related to that are more specific to the urban population than for the countryside. Uh, Largely, the development of cities has been happening so far without any proper planning, which makes it difficult for us today to come up with a unified approach for development of all cities, something standardized that would help build healthy habitat environment for people. New principles of urban planning that would promote urban health were named by the World Health Organization as one of top priorities until the year 2050. What's peculiar about Russia is that we have a very large number of small cities. Over the past years, we've seen a very vivid trend outflow of population from smaller to larger cities, which on the one hand impacts their social economic development and on the other hand creates very sharp divide within a region or between regions and definitely impacts the demographic situation in the country generally. Therefore, our task today is to achieve development of small cities with population below 50,000 people to reduce inequality in terms of quality of urban life as compared to larger cities. We have almost 2,000 smaller cities in Russia where 23 million people live. Putting emphasis on smaller cities with low density of population, reducing gap in terms of social economic development, different regions or within regions, is our top priority that's outlined in the strategy of space development that was adopted in 2018 and it will be implemented by the year 2025 for such cities. It's especially important to create convenient social infrastructure that would cover healthcare facilities, kindergartens, social services, offering people opportunities for health and recreation. When people are unable to get high quality health care or have quality recreation time or get vocational education, finding good high quality jobs are the main factors of internal migration and outflow of people from minor cities. In the past 15 years, the population of the cities reduced by one and a half million. In Russia, the outflow mostly happened from Privolsk, Uralsk, Sibirsk and far eastern regions, most people migrated to Moscow, St. Petersburg, Krasnodar region, and some other regions and cities. If we talk about large cities, 
health risks are more pronounced, especially if we're talking about megacities or metropolitan areas with population level of over one million. For such territories, it's very important to create urban environment that will be convenient for all groups of people. We need to give up the idea of functional districts and move to a new approach. More and more popular becoming such approaches to urban planning that would take into account needs of separate social groups, children, adolescents, persons with disabilities. At the same time, we see that developments that reduce negative impact on environment, on human health, are becoming more and more popular. Air and water purifiers, for instance, safe roads, or new principles of urban planning. As I list those elements, I want to stress that these are priorities that were identified by our president for the development of our country generally. They were stated back in 2018. Access to social infrastructure is becoming more and more relevant. The role of healthcare system is becoming more important. Not only are we monitoring, but we're also focusing on prevention and interaction with population, checkups, out patients, in patients, all of these are priorities as part of our national program, healthcare. Another mechanism that would promote health in cities would be shift towards healthy nutrition. Since there's no natural, since there's no food production in cities and at the same time there's large selection of foodstuffs, quality and safety of foodstuff becomes more important. And environmental situation makes it important to make sure that our citizens get enough vitamins and nutrients that would reduce negative impact of the environment and remain healthy. What we're planning to do, we're planning to motivate people to change their nutrition habits, give up fast food, and adopt new approaches to nutrition. Uh, our projects on demography, that section dealing with healthy nutrition is focusing on exactly that. As we work on urban planning, we need not forget about digitalization. On the one hand, services become more accessible. On the other hand, new diseases emerge, stresses, eye diseases, uh, psychological conditions, and a number of others. We're yet to understand what impact of digital technologies will have on human health. All these challenges clearly show that there's need to come up with new approaches to the development of urban territories, focusing on health, social, economic, and epidemiological well-being of people. We think it's mandatory that we closely look into and analyze all implications of all decisions we make from the viewpoint of human health. We need to modernize approach to designing urban uh, projects. We need to educate new generation of urban planners. We need to introduce new standards. As we understand those challenges, uh, the World Health Organization has been implementing its city health program for over 20 years, and we fully support and endorse principles that were endorsed in the memo of mayors of 100 cities were determined to make urban health our priority, a ski driver our priority, reduce all health factors impact, achieve engagement and participation of civil society, provide health and social services that would be people-oriented. So we are no exception to the general trend and those principles about all our priority projects and strategies. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive answer to my question. For this, I would like to give the floor to Anna Yurievna, Anna Popova. Anna, you are the guardian of people's health as sanitary doctor of Russia. So if we look at new threats and challenges from the urban planning point of view, which ones would you identify? Thank you very much for this opportunity. I would like to welcome all colleagues and thank Tatiana Kolikova for finding time in her very tight schedule. I would like to thank 
Sergei Sobyanin for his opening statement and Moscow city government for this opportunity to discuss those very relevant topics today. Tatiana Goliko, in her statement, gave a very comprehensive overview of what is urban health, all types of cities, and what are the priorities of the Russian Federation and how are those priorities going to be achieved. But I would like to stress that we've come a long way already, and this Urban Health Congress is a first event of a kind. It's dedicated to a health of a big city. The work that we started with the government of the city of Moscow four years back resulted in this very important discussion with world's leading experts in the field. And this is indeed an emerging trend. You can I have my presentation on the screen, please? I, I understand it's too small to read, but still. The situation today is characterized by a number of factors. So as the previous speakers have already mentioned, our, there are many factors that impact our health. Their intensity differs, and that has been like that throughout the history of humanity. At some point in history, communicable diseases prevailed. Then the situation changed. And then non-communicable diseases prevailed because of uh, sedentary lifestyle, change of nutrition standards, and a number of other factors. And as we changed the world around you, and we did globally, we are there's noise pollution, there are electric waves, uh, there's light pollution, uh, the chemical elements surrounding us are different than a few centuries back. Biological factors are different now than centuries ago. And what you see on the slide, on the diagram, might make you think that pandemic risks are going down. But un unfortunately, it is not true. They're going up, especially in large cities, because contagious diseases, communicable diseases, are becoming even more dangerous. We made a calculation. Let me give you an example. So if you spend one hour standing in Moscow subway, this is just this is new data. For instance, in Komsomolsky subway station, you will contact 10,000 people. And this means that increases dramatically your chances of contracting a disease. The city has been doing a lot to take care of those risks, such as air mortis diseases spread, but we need a new approach. And Sergei Simonovich and Moscow government at some point starting transforming Moscow, changing the face of Moscow, and it has become obvious for us, people that work on in epidemiology, we could clearly see that things were changing, but not everyone could appreciate. Now that we have statistics, now that we have collected information, we can say that health risks related to infrastructure in Moscow have reduced twofold almost, which is a lot if we look at different chemical factors. I would also like to highlight that the approach that shapes health of big cities unites a number of different angles. As we started working on the subject, we figured out that we needed to work with those that work in urban planning, health, sociologists, large number of experts. If we want to achieve, we need comprehensive approach to achieve desired results. So Moscow, obviously, is not the only mega city. There are larger cities in the world. So to understand how things stand globally, we, together with Moscow government, came up with a project that has been uh, already implemented to study cases of New York, London, Singapore, Toronto, and Seoul. So this is a very brief summary of what we identified. We sent missions of experts, academia, officials of Moscow government, and they were trying to analyze 
specific programs. And it's obvious that health is high on every city's agenda. But there are three cities that stand aside, that we singled out as best practice experience, consistent approach to urban health development, and that means access of city dwellers to healthy nutrition, city that is comfortable for elderly, uh, monitoring of impact of all policies on human health, and also proactive implementation of principles of urban health and Singapore and Seoul stand aside. So they're very good examples of proactive approaches to urban design, which we felt was really important promotion of healthy nutrition. I already mentioned that, but that deserves uh, another mention. For Singapore, also what's important, it's uh, high temperatures in the city is a big problem. Therefore, reducing heat levels is uh, their priority, and they have a separate project dedicated to that. In Seoul, it's very important to preserve natural environment. And Seoul authorities are stressing environmental protection. A few more slides. We analyzed the example of London. We looked at best practices, something we could introduce, something we could learn from. Transportation is the main principle. And pedestrian flows. So we did an analysis. And we came up with this uh, this idea, had every dweller of London taken a bike for 20 minutes in a day that would have saved the government of London 1.7 billion pounds for health care in the next 25 years. If we look at New York, access of all city dwellers to healthy food is their priority. Other priorities are city for elderly, active design, green city, and also, just as for Singapore, reducing heat levels during summer. So there's, they have a age-friendly NYC program that can, that is composed of 59 initiatives aimed at supporting at the elderly. In the next 20 years, according to forecast, the number of New Yorkers over 65 will increase by half. And by 2040, it will stand at 20.6%. So moving to Canada, active longevity and healthy nutrition are the two priorities. Canada have uh, some regulations that are important for us. For instance, they look at nutrition levels, levels of micronutrients, vitamins in food, and they regulate it. And we also found very important the program to encourage school children to eat more fruits and vegetables. Northern Fruits and Vegetable Program is on the right side of the slide. And Student Nutrition Program also is also targeted at school children. Back to Singapore. I already mentioned heat waves. But that's complemented by healthy nutrition, uh, increasing green areas, active lifestyle, and priority to bicycles. Cities we visited, cities we studied, all have major trends. And health, urban health, is mainstreamed in most of policies. All policies implemented in cities go under motto, it's all done for the health of cities and health of urban population. And this is a very important principle. And this is something we need to introduce in our large cities. Moscovites are fortunate because this is how Moscow develops. But Moscow is not the only city of Russia. There are other cities, large and small, and urban health should be in the center of any decision city authorities take. Control and monitoring. Rospatrebnadzor has been doing monitoring, uh, epidemiological monitoring, for the past 25 years. We've accumulated a lot of statistics we're analyzing. And as digital technologies are introduced, 
we need to adapt because we need to constantly monitor new factors that emerge, that impact our life. For instance, we're just saying that we need to introduce regulation for 5G. We're just done with 4G. And now there's this new factor. And new, new factors will be emerging. And we'll have to look at them. And there are many such factors that are relevant for large cities. What I think is very important is to develop research centers. The topic of health in big cities is important for a number of research disciplines. We don't have a comprehensive research center that would deal with all aspects of the problem. I don't think that exists anywhere in the world. So we need this research center that could produce some sort of a program of action tailored to the needs of every city. This is what we need. And also competence building, skills building is important. I know there are students present in the room from architectural, medical universities, social sciences universities. I hope they pay attention to what I say now. It's important that constructors, that builders, architects, as they study, they think of health impact of every project they implement, of every solution they offer. And people in healthcare need to understand that a mega city dweller will be impacted by different factors, environmental factors. I would also like to mention that according to European Commission, they have this joint research center, a European spends on average indoors about 90% of his time, the active part of his life, and the remaining part he spends in urban environment. So I would like to wish, and I hope that this first International Urban Health Congress that has brought together amazing experts in the field. I hope it will be a success story. I hope we will achieve the desired results. And I believe we will. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Yurievna, not only for giving this overview of the problem, but also for the great suggestions you made that will help improve situation, Sergei Semenovich. Uh, the research summarized best practices of cities, and we know that Moscow has been very active in social sector access to health care in Moscow in the past few years, and it has been mentioned by all, has improved dramatically. But this idea to introduce health agenda, to mainstream health agenda in all policies of uh, city planning, which is is the priority of the forum. I can give my personal example. When I visited uh, one of the major provinces in China, I've seen the project, and uh, we I'm from Skolkovo. We're looking for innovation projects when the system of providing medical health has been closely tied up with the management of the general traffic in the city. Even navigation system for ambulances car is changing the work of the traffic lights to, to uh, speed up the evacuation of patients uh, from the from their places to, to hospitals. So the question for you is the city mayor, how the health agenda is going through all the policies and how the health will, will be integrated in transportation, in landscaping, in, 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 uh, in construction? Well, as for um, transporting um, uh, patients uh, from, let's say, from the traffic accidents is a very critical thing. As you may know, in Moscow, We've decreased uh, the time when the ambulance reaches the, ho um, the uh, hospital almost by the factor of 1.5 in the time from uh, a call, incoming call to the time when the ambulance comes to pick up a patient. This uh, time in Moscow is the smallest of all the mega cities in the world. Despite the fact that uh, amid the very heavy congestion of traffic, it's not an easy thing to do. In addition to dedicated lanes, the, the ambulance stations in different uh, districts are located in such a way that the time of delivering patients would be minimal. 
I believe that this is not the most important thing in today's agenda. We are speaking about systemic urban technologies and how do they impact lives of city residents and their health situation. And we've been speaking about elderly population and uh, uh, we've heard an example of New York. Indeed, it's uh, one of the biggest challenges that is a change in structure of the population. In Moscow, uh, over 3 million people are people of uh, retirement age. And with every new year, their number is uh, growing. And uh, as of today, about half a million of Muscovites have, uh, have reached the age level of 60 years old. And of course, the urban services and the urban health care services are changing to adapt the situation that would not be impossible to continue these activities otherwise. And people of uh, senior age, they may uh, be experiencing even the bigger stress than those people who are of, uh, of uh, younger or middle age brackets. It can be explained uh, by the fact that one of the factors of stress in the city, despite, of course, the big number of people, is loneliness. Loneliness. And uh, the people cannot find themselves, cannot find their social use. And we were thinking about how to change this situation. And um, having consulted with uh, senior citizens, we've built the uh, program Moscow Longevity, which presupposes involvement of quite a big number of people of uh, senior age groups into very active lifestyles. And this program had been initiated, uh, and the program was quite a, quite a big scale. We were speaking about millions of people. We have included into this uh, program all the uh, city structure, healthcare, social services, education, culture, sports, uh, etc. We have done uh, the big list of activities for the senior citizen who otherwise would not be able to sign up to different clubs and groups um, at the places of their residence. We would like to engage them in the sport activities and theater activities, uh, learning new things, increasing their professional levels, studying new technologies and things of the like. And we've seen a quite a positive response. Today, several hundred thousands of people in Moscow are um, feeling that they're needed, feeling that they can uh, communicate to someone. And psychologically, the health of this strata of population, I would say, is getting better. And um, at least um, by the response of those I've been communicating with, people feel that they're, again, socially engaged. They're not um, alone anymore, and therefore it's a very important initiative. This uh, type of uh, steps as the London's uh, program to to increase the pedestrian streets and to increase overall physical activities. We have also been implementing the similar programs. The program My Street in Moscow is a 100% uh, urban health type of program. What do I mean by that? It's a program which uh, calls for uh, taking people out on the streets and creating a very safe and comfortable environment where people would would find it very pleasing and relaxing simply to take a stroll. Like uh, we've heard, 20-minute walk means that we can eventually uh, save to up to 2 billion pounds. And translating into medical language, it means the decreasing the chronic diseases uh, incidence and rate by almost 20 percent. We did not pursue this particular goal to connect these medical goals with financial outcomes and goals, but it's still obvious that city dwellers simply cannot exist, um, uh, you know, shuttling from home to work and back to home. They need physical activities. They need some public spaces. And uh, they need to feel as a part of the urban community at, uh, at the common spaces. It is very important because this is the way to decrease urban-related stress. It's about feeling that you are living in a comfortable environment. And of course, these type of initiatives uh, deserve our attention. And I believe that these are one of the priority focuses of developing comfortable urban environment. Sergei Semyonovich, thank you very much. I would like to uh, divert from our plan and ask Tatiana. I am myself a user of uh, bicycle lanes. I am cycling. 
but unfortunately it is not always uh, they're not always occupied and we do have infrastructure the city invested heavily in bike lanes in your presentation you have been speaking about uh, people's motivation to take care of their their health could you please share your personal opinion what do you think should be done to make sure that people are start using this uh, great infrastructure and taking better care of themselves and spending more time on their health situation. I would like to say, Kirill, that uh, lately Moscow has changed a lot and we as uh, people who live in the city give very high evaluation to those uh, changes of uh, infrastructure, be it social infrastructure or economic infrastructure. And for many years on the government level, we have been promoting the philosophy of a healthy lifestyle. We've changed our legislation. Uh, we are uh, contracting uh, tobacco smoking, alcohol abuse, and, and a very passive lifestyle when people are not very active. And in this regard, Moscow is demonstrating very positive trends. And I would say that in the last two years especially, the behavioral motivation of the Moscovites has changed to a large extent. You are saying that people do not cycle a lot. They do not use bike lanes. But I want to say that every time I go out to the street and I'm crossing the bike lane, people tell me you have to yield away, which means that people are using these um, cycling lanes. And generally speaking, uh, the city is about dwellers and the way people are evaluating changes. It means that the city is alive, the city is uh, evolving, the city is prospering. And we uh, can say assuredly about Moscow that, of course, uh, someone can say otherwise, that the Moscow is a capital of the country. It has a lot of financial resources, but still, compared to other cities in Russia, Moscow is demonstrating very positive changes, especially when it comes to people's motivation to become healthier. And today we are discussing the urban health topic. And Sergei Sabyanin has mentioned uh, in the very beginning about the older categories of population. I would like to say that behavioral model of our population in the age bracket uh, 60 plus or even 65 plus uh, has changed. Uh, very dramatically and all of our uh, older men and women even people of the older age they know what the mayor of the city is uh, doing to make sure that they would uh, live longer and live uh, happier and we as the federation level and as Muscovites on the other hand uh, can only welcome and support these changes which are taking place in our city and to uh, spread these practices all over the country. Thank you, Tatiana. And I would like to give the floor to Joe Ivy Beaufort. Uh, Ms. Beaufort is the head of the International Society for Urban Health. Uh, it's an international platform which has been in existence for 15 years and it's uh, combines experts and organizations from different countries and they are attempting to develop some common approaches um, to connect healthcare and urbanism. And my question for you, Joe, actually, what are the latest uh, trends and tendencies? What are the approaches? And is there any universal approach or are there any country related specifics and differences? Uh, I'm looking at the presentation, you can see. And how can we combine this problem? Thank you, Joe, the floor is yours. It's a real honor to be here, and I also want to congratulate the mayor on convening this session and, and kicking off this wonderful Congress with the topic of health. It's, uh, it's not as common as one might think, and um, I've noticed since I've been here, I was here in the 90s a few times, and uh, most recently when Russia hosted the uh, high-level forum consultation on NCDs, prevention, um, before it went to the General Assembly, in 2015, and I think the transformation in Moscow is quite remarkable, so congratulations to, to you and your team. I was really asked to, to talk about sort of global trends, and um, I want to say first how special this meeting is, because um, we are clearly have an audience that has a very high level of knowledge of broad determinants of health, and that's quite unusual. Still, globally, when you go to um, meetings on urbanization, you rarely hear the word health mentioned. And when you go to meetings on health, it's usually about health care. Um, and we really rarely talk about the opportunities and the challenges of, of achieving health in, in cities. So I welcome this integration is quite exciting. Um, I think the, the reality also is uh, not as well 
not as visible globally um, that urbanization is really one of the great public health challenges of our era, along with notions that have been mentioned, the epidemiological shift from acute disease to chronic, the demographic shift, which is actually a, we like to think of it as a victory of public health, that people have longer life expectancy when you consider the alternative. Um, but it does mean we have to attend to it. And similarly, uh, climate change is a really important issue. So the visibility of urbanization is really advanced um, by meetings like this. Um, another thing that's become very clear recently is urbanization is not just an issue of the global north. Um, it's true in every region, and in fact, the rate of urbanization is faster um, in low and middle income countries uh, who often don't have the resources to cope with the changes in infrastructure. And um, as we know, cities really drive um, the economic development, culture, arts, and others because of their global communication. Uh, but they also are uh, responsible for uh, well over the majority of uh, global use of energy and production of global waste and pollution. So that we can't reach the sustainable development goals without attention to the health of cities. And this again is not um, as fundamental an understanding uh, in the global conversation. But uh, thanks to UN Habitat's work uh, on uh, looking at the new urban agenda, which has been developing in parallel to the WHO's work with Healthy Cities um, and the SDGs, uh, there's much increased interest in working directly with mayors at the global level. This is the first time we've had global goals um, which are going underneath the national leadership to really deal uh, with mayors. A lot of excitement, um, groups of mayors dealing with climate change, dealing with air pollution, uh, dealing with aging, dealing with resilience and, and response to emergencies. Um, for health professionals, looking at urban health has been an enormous paradigm shift because our traditional attention has been uh, with the personal health care delivery system. Um, universal health coverage is sort of the dominant conversation in global health meetings, um, dealing with health systems, with health care, uh, with health workforce. All of these are very important, but relatively unexplored are the health benefits of thinking about the choices being made in transportation, in urban planning, in housing, um, that really affect health in some ways more than access to health care. Um, and you've heard a lot about that this morning. Um, and in the last 15 to 20 years, um, there's been an enormously developing evidence base um, looking at these um, health impacts of decisions made for in transportation. Do you go for cars? Do you go for mass transit and active mobility of pedestrians or bicycles? Um, similarly, planning of green space, the kinds of things that you see in Moscow. Um, you can't really accomplish activity in all of these sectors, uh, align them without um, working across agencies of government also um, with government partnerships with the private sector, with civil society organizations, and especially with communities. Um, and our colleague mentioned research, and I think the issue of interdisciplinary research, which is fundamental to understanding these issues, is still very difficult for the academy and something that really has to be promoted. Um, so, so finally, I think every city uh, approaches its challenges differently. Um, depending on a few elements. First of all, um, the authority of local governments in a country are quite different. Some local governments have a lot of authority over uh, taxation, over decision making, over land use. Other local, local governments have very little authority from the central government. This is a big variable from country to country. Secondly, of course, the resources available to invest especially in infrastructure. Um, and also the nature of the stakeholders um, that make these changes happen in a city. So um, the entry level is very often uh, uh, sort of varies by region, and I don't want to generalize, but I think it's interesting that the issues of air quality um, and energy use are very visible as opening points in urban development in the US, in Europe, in Asia. Um, the issue of transportation and mobility, uh, very, uh, very good examples in Latin America and Europe. Um, and food systems and the link between urban and rural environments has been one of the themes in, in developing thinking about African cities. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really quite interesting there. So um, the key to all of this, of course, 
um, sitting next to me. It's political leadership. This is true in every city around the world. It's very hard to come by because I think mayors are in a position to organize within government, organize these partnerships that are really crucial. And the important thing to remember about principles in urban development is that there may be models, there is definitely evidence, but the governance of the city for change is always local mm -hmm. because the stakeholders are always different and the elected officials are always different. And so we have to always adapt the evidence to the local situation. So again, this notion of health at all governance, which has been a theme um, developed by our colleagues from Finland who are represented here. A um, couple of really important points about that approach. We've heard the health impact questions, but just to highlight two issues. One of them is that if we think about the health care system, we often think about health as an expense. If we think about health, we think about health as an investment, an investment in social and economic development. It frames the issue very differently. Um, and secondly, that the impacts of these health determinants um, fall very differently on different groups within cities. And so we have to be aware of disparities and inequities and really engage communities in problem solving because ultimately they are the experts on their own lives. Um, and so again, I think we see most of these elements in the changes that are happening in Moscow and I congratulate you and I want you to bring this story into the global arena because we really have very little representation uh, from Russia or from this region in these global conversations. So we can treat it as invitation, right? Absolutely. <laughs> China, November 4th to 8th in Jamen is our next international society meeting. Uh, dear Sergey, Joyce mentioned a lot about the importance of leadership and leadership of a mayor in this issue. I see you want to comment. Not, not about leadership, though. I would like to say something uh, else. I would like to say that the, the common notion and opinion is that big city environment and ecology is decreasing from year to year in big cities. It's an irreversible trend. I would like to say that it's simply not true. Situation is evolving uh, totally different. The share of industry in urban environment is uh, dropping, and it's objectively impacting ecological factor. The remaining enterprises are paying a lot of attention, being pressured by the federal and the local authorities to improve uh, ecology, uh, ecological footprint and impact of their companies. Moscow Refinery, for example, has decreased its impact by 90 percent through reorganizing their production chain. But the overwhelming majority of um, harmful emissions today is not only coming from factories or from industry. These are the cars we're driving, you and I. And uh, Ms. Buford was absolutely correct in saying that transportation behavior and transport policies having direct impact on ecology of big cities. Yeah. And those bans that were introduced both at city and at federal level in terms of type of gasoline or type of engines from the environmental point of view has already had impact. We introduced them in Moscow even before they were introduced at the federal level. And the quality of cars is improving dramatically and we're setting an example in Moscow. In only a few years, we managed to transform the pool of Moscow cars. It's the youngest in Europe, but the most environmentally friendly. And the changes happening both for private vehicles and cargo vehicles. And due to that and level of emission, harmful gases to atmosphere, produced by over two times in just a few years. And we see that water air, soil, quality in Moscow are changing, but not for the worse. They're not deteriorating. They're changing for the better. We're now approaching a new breakthrough revolution because electronic vehicles are coming into market. So we've made this step forward even faster than private car owners. We at the city level because we decided to stop procuring combustion engine buses for Moscow in 2021. So we will no longer be buying gasoline buses any longer in two years' time. We're already procuring 
new environmentally friendly buses, over 300 such buses already tour in the streets of Moscow and will be procuring at least 300 such buses every year. Now we're working on an agreement with a company that will create a production and engineering center for electric buses for Moscow. And we're also negotiating with yet another company to develop a network of charging stations for electronic vehicles. So I'm sure that the situation will change dramatically in the next five years. And this will be our major contribution to improving the environmental quality of our cities. We're looking forward to that, Sergei Simanovich. And we in Skolkovo are supporting startups that work on electronic vehicles. And I like where we're going in our discussion. So we're shifting from design and climate, we're shifting to talking about money. And money matters when we talk about procurement, planning, thinking of how city procurement will impact urban health. I would like to give the photo to Francesca Colombo from OECD, who is in charge of health at a glance report. I would like to talk to us about finding this balance, this fine line between investment in long-term protection and prevention in healthcare, such as health infrastructure, jogging path, etc., and checking balance with short-term goals, because we need to invest in healthcare today. So how to find this balance and whether long-term investment is worth it? Yes. It's a balance that uh, all the countries and all the different uh, local governments are struggling with because it's a balance which is tilted very much towards healthcare. And I don't say that healthcare is not necessary. Uh, we do need to think even about how to transform completely healthcare. We have built health systems over the years which are focused around hospitals, they are focused about acute care services, they are focused about episodic care. And with aging of the population, and we were heard from the previous speakers, growing chronic conditions and so forth, we need that radically fundamental transformations even in the healthcare systems so that we have much more primary care, much more community uh, services, much more care for the elderly. This is not easy because it's very, very easy to inaugurate a new hospital, but once you have it, it absorbs lots, lots, lots of resources and changing the balance towards this uh, different uh, type of healthcare delivery system is ex extremely complicated. So we always say, for example, that you need to shift the generations of reform, so move from a focus really on acute care and, and hospitals to something which is much more the health of the populations. Let me go now to say a few things about the issues of, uh, uh, of prevention and, and public health. It makes sense, it makes not just health sense, but really economic sense to invest in prevention of disease, in promotion of health, because these interventions are cost effectiveness. Um, but still, when we look at how much we spend on health prevention and disease promotion, this is only 3% in the most advanced economies or middle eco economies, it's only 3% of total health expenditure. So it's a very, very tiny little fraction. It's true, obviously, that there will be spending in other parts of governments that go towards the elderly population, but 3% of healthcare spending, it's very, very, very tiny. Mm -hmm. And what happens also in moments of economic crisis, like what uh, happened when Europe went through a quite dramatic economic crisis, is that the very, very first thing which is cut is prevention. Because it's very, very difficult to cut on hospitals once you have bid the hospital. But the preventions, it's something that you can uh, change from one day to, to the next in a way. You can cut on, on these aspects. And also the very um, uh, good beneficial impacts of prevention is something that accumulates over a very, very long period of time. So if you invest in a package of preventions to tackle uh, obesity, for example, and that requires all sorts of things, so obviously uh, encouraging much more active uh, populations, uh, encouraging children to do more physical activity, uh, encouraging people to take a bike as opposed to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to taking the car, uh, but also food labeling policies, mass uh, media campaigns, all of those uh, interventions which are very, very cost effective and we've done economic analysis uh, which really shows that it's cost effective. But the benefits are generated over decades. 
So it is not, it's something that it needs continuous political leadership, going back to what Joe was saying about the importance of political leadership, to ensure that we keep this on the agenda because yes, the economic benefits are there, but they accrue over a long uh, period of time. So it does require having a little bit of those, uh, you know, looking beyond even the political cycle and terms to think about the benefits of populations in the, in the longer term. Uh, just uh, some examples, uh, I mean, obesity. Obesity, we know it's a major challenge for all uh, societies, <coughs> not just high-income countries, but even emerging economies and low-income uh, countries, which are she uh, seeing a shift, a, a dramatic epidemiological shift. Uh, right now we have uh, in, uh, in OECD countries like three in five people are overweight or obese and it's really quite uh, impressive, uh, impressive number. The consequences, and that's probably something that for politicians is important, the consequences of that are not just poor health but they're all economic consequences. It means lower labor market productivity for individuals um, in terms of being less productive at work, but also in terms of poorer uh, outcomes, labor market outcomes. And even for pupils, pupils who are obese tend to have uh, more negative uh, uh, outcomes uh, and uh, results uh, in terms of their curriculum and their schooling. So there is an economic uh, cost of, of obesity, and we have estimated that for around 3.5% of GDP. So if you don't have overweight and obesity, you could have uh, you know, uh, GDP, which is higher, 3 to 5%. Uh, and at the same time, investing on those package of interventions is cost effective. So reduce health spending and improves labor market productivity. So really critical, important to keep that long term perspective, not, you know, a seed, the temptation to the short term, a need perhaps to, to generate uh, savings uh, in the health system, really, really keep the long term perspective because it's what will generate the gains in the longer terms. Thank you very much. I would like to change the order of our speakers when OECD government, global organization, City managers talk about long-term projects. It, it's easy to understand because they can plan for long term. But I would like to ask Mr. Lund, who represents a private company, Nova Nordics, who is responsible for City Changing Diabetes program. So it's a long-term prevention program aimed at protecting people from diabetes. Nova Nordic sends insulin. So what, Ms. so what Mr. Norder does, he undermines future profits of his company. Why are you doing this? Well, it's, uh, it, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to come here. I'm very honored to be here. It's my first time in, in Moscow, and it's a beautiful city, so I hope it's not the last time, <laughs> uh, really. Um, you're doing a lot of fantastic work uh, that I want to compliment you uh, on. I think there's also uh, a lot to learn from Moscow in other cities around the world. But to your question, it is a paradox, isn't it? We have been in the field of uh, diabetes for 95 years. We produce half the world's insulin. Uh, you can say, as a businessman, a, a market that grows 5% per year, the number of people with diabetes, that's a good market, right? The problem is, we're all taxpayers, or we're all some who ask people to pay tax. I pay tax myself. As a company, we pay tax. And in the long run, that's not sustainable. I live in a country where we have reached the level of, what, the level of tax we want to pay, and taxes are not popular. So there's an, a, a limit to what can happen. At the same time, we see a, a growth in obesity and diabetes that will bank bankrupt our economies, you know, in 10, 15, 20 years. And then what happens to a company like Novo Nordisk? We've been, for the last 95 years, been working with innovation. We want to develop new medicines, uh, cures from, uh, for, for diabetes uh, and, and other serious chronic diseases. But who will pay for it? You won't pay for it because you will be busy paying for all of the, all of the people who are in the health system. So we need to tackle diabetes across all of the specters. You know, of course, improving care for the people who have diabetes, but also avoiding more people coming in. Trust me, we will have a good business with the people who already have diabetes. But, there is a, but, but if we don't turn the tide now, 
It, it is just as with climate change. I believe obesity, and I agree very much with what uh, Francesca said, obesity is probably to healthcare what CO2 is to climate change. If we don't tackle it now, by mid-century, and certainly by end century, it will really do a lot of bad things to both our health system, to our productive sector, and to uh, quality of life in, in, in general. And that's, where, that's why we are engaged in it. We have a, a partnership with uh, now 22 cities around the world, started five years ago, and it's actually focused on prevention of obesity and diabetes outside the healthcare system because you need to have a health in all policies. You need to look at transportation, you need to look at the productive sector, and then you need to understand vulnerability and inequality in your city, because those are the pockets where the need is the largest. We have a great uh, number of people, as the mayor mentioned, uh, you know, people who are, 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 are lonely, people who are isolated, and there's a lot of uh, economic uh, and and individual deprivation that we need to address, and those are the ones that are at risk of the largest challenges with diabetes. So in an economic sense, it makes a lot of sense. You just need to have the long perspective for a pharmaceutical company to be engaged in the prevention of diabetes, because we believe it is uh, for the totality of, of patients and also the ones who could be patients, we need to, uh, to take a responsibility. Thank you. Спасибо большое. Действительно, хороший ответ. Мне кажется, Thank you very much. It's a brilliant answer, and it's a very good approach of a cooperation to this comprehensive problem that's relevant for all of us, us as human beings. So my question, my next question goes to Madame Visekane from Helsinki, Deputy Mayor on Social Issues. So I would like to ask you to answer very briefly the same question I asked to Sergei Sadanian previously, this idea that healthcare should be streamlined in all health policies. How is that implemented in Helsinki? Could you share with us best practices or success stories, something we could learn from and use? For your uh, invitation, and I'm very happy to be here to share Helsinki's experience. Um, like I said, uh, we have been implementing uh, health in all policies for a very long time. I think it's uh, part of our kind of core of our welfare thinking in, in Finland, and, and Finland has been rated uh, uh, last the happiest country in the world. Uh, it's not the mental uh, stage in, inside of our head, but I think it uh, very much is reflected in the, in the welfare thinking uh, of our society. Um, that we have uh, built the social trust uh, between people and, and then also between uh, the system and, and the people. Um, in Helsinki we have been, of course, having a, a, lo a lot of uh, programs on uh, reducing risks of health risks, uh, preventing uh, use of alcohol, preventing uh, also tobacco use and, and very good results, uh, especially on, uh, among younger people. Um, but what is new and why we are also very uh, enthusiastic of this topic again and, and very happy that Moscow has also taken this, uh, this important uh, topic in, in, in this uh, conversation today is, is the fact that um, we have also um, created in the city a promotion of health and well-being structure, a leadership structure. Um, and, and the key is that the whole city is now uh, part of the uh, structure. whole city is responsible uh, for implementing this program. Uh, we have 28 goals, uh, 108 uh, different indicators uh, 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 for the actions. And uh, we share the strategy in, in all divisions. And, and, and what is very important, I think, is that the citizens are involved. Uh, otherwise, in this uh, society, open society, uh, where people also want to have individual lives, uh, uh, you, you have to have the, the citizens involved also planning how to do it. Um, so we are a member, um, or we are going to be a member of the WHO, European Health Cities, uh, important uh, uh, network, and also very happy to be uh, part of uh, other international networks. And we also uh, are reporting for the UN on the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I think we are the second city in the world uh, uh, to do that next week in, in New York. We are going to report uh, what we, how we are um, uh, taking part of the Sustainable de Development Goals. So this is. Uh, part of a maybe a larger agenda and, and also um, happy to ha have more uh, cities involved. 
but how, what we are focusing, I think very much of it uh, has been mentioned here already, um, important is the reducing inequality so no one is left behind uh, really to tackle what, uh, um, what the previous uh, um, persons also have said about tackle um, those who are not so well off uh, to, to help them and, and their support. Um, to increase the mobility, so um, bike lanes, uh, we already know 78% uh, of uh, Helsinki residents are either taking the public transportation or our city, uh, the bikes or, or walking, but we need to still increase it. It means also difficult political decisions that the space needs to be taken from the, from the cars, uh, but uh, we know that it's going to bring uh, very good health effects and very important for the climate change as, as, as here discussed also uh, earlier. Um, but then also how to involve the old people uh, who are, have, might have difficulties of leaving um, uh, home, so make it uh, city accessible. So uh, comprehensive plan, uh, but I would uh, summarize that the important is, uh, is to have that uh, leadership that is uh, mainstreamed in the, in the whole agenda, uh, agenda and have the citizens involved. Thank you very much. I would like to draw the attention of the audience to the fact that transportation problem has been mentioned in all of our speakers. I would like to ask Ms. Sanders, who is promoting the concept of healthy streets, and this concept has already been incorporated in a number of projects that have been implemented. So how can we introduce health aspects in transportation and how do we make it work? I'm a public health specialist by background and I chose to work with the transport and city planning sector because I realized this is the single biggest way to change the health and well-being of people in cities. Um, the negative um, health impacts come from how we choose to manage motorized transport in our cities. And we can take a different approach that will not only reduce the negative impacts that we've heard about today, the noise, road danger, poor air quality, low physical activity. We can, we can address all of these and also at the same time introduce many positive benefits of social connectedness, of community well-being and reducing inequality. But to do this, we have to have a focus on what is the human experience like on our streets. If we focus every decision that we make on how do we change the street so it feels like a better place for people to be, it addresses all of these problems in one coherent way. And to make this something real, I developed something called the Healthy Streets Approach. And this framework has been adopted in London and is now being adopted in other cities around the world. It's a cross-government approach, uh, similar to was discussed for Helsinki. It brings together all the different parts of government who influence how the street feels. And by everyone working together, they ad address all of these health issues. And the reason why across government everyone is happy to work together is because they can see that taking this healthy streets approach, it doesn't just improve health and improve transport, but it, it, it helps the city to be uh, stronger economically, it supports tourism, and it improves the environment at the same time. And maybe most important is that it's very popular. So we've talked about political leadership, but political leaders need to um, serve the needs of their people, and they need to do things that are popular. And this Healthy Streets framework is popular with people in cities because who doesn't want to live on a healthy street? Thank you very much, uh, Sergei Simeonovich. We are concluding our session now. And I suppose the final question for you that I have. We have two days of work ahead of us. We will have a lot of different sessions. We will have detailed discussions of different issues. And we are going to run the final session. We will make conclusions. But based on uh, today's meeting, based on this discussion, what is your perspective? These approaches which had been articulated by experts, Russian and uh, foreign ones as well, what is the focus of your attention? Which ideas do you think would be most beneficial for Moscow? Lucy mentioned one very important word or a phrase, 
about inequality, urban inequality. Whenever we engage in certain projects in a big city and they're being localized, for example, the project My Street in Moscow, it's mostly about the historic center of the city. It seems we've done a lot, 300 streets. It's a quite a big scale in scope. But Moscow has 3,000 streets, not 300 streets. What about the others? And people in Moscow, they do not uh, live on the Tverskaya streets predominantly. Mostly they live in so-called bedroom communities on the outskirts of the city. How about these places? And we have always promoted the ideology of equality of the city residents uh, of different communities. And we are working on increasing transportation accessibility, building metro, building roads, leading into different communities so that every Muscovite would have the uh, walking access to, let's say, metro station or a public uh, transit uh, station. We've always been thinking that every Moscow resident would have a good school access which would be financed equally as those schools which are in the core of the city. We want to make sure that we have very high quality hospitals, uh, community centers, um, uh, performing arts and music schools, great park, to make sure that every Moscovite, irrespectively of their residence, would feel equally comfortable, would, um, would feel that they are truly belong to Moscow. And summing up this experience, uh, this year we have um, built a program called My Neighborhood. It's, uh, it's truly one of the key programs, and it's aimed at uh, dealing with inequality and integrated development of each district and community of Moscow. Basically, we're speaking about that each district of Moscow is the small city in itself small town in itself. And this ideology is being supported by the urban community. And I believe that along with local residents, we will be able to make yet another step towards uh, better better equality of, uh, of the residents and the increased comfort of the urban environment. Thank you. Thank you. And we uh, hope that this equality will translate into better health. And thanks to this session, um, we will see some good progress, and I'm wishing all the experts, all, all the panels, all the forum participants very successful engagements and work. And let's uh, final for the uh, meet for the final session after today's. Thank you. Dear guests of the Moscow Urban Forum 2019. The International Urban Health Congress is open and it will continue in Urban Health Auditorium. And in the Moscow Hall, in, in 10 minutes, we start talk show not only standardized construction. What is the architect's perspective on modern housing?